Welcome everyone to Powering Real-Time Decisions with Continuous Data Streams. Today I'm joined by Matt and Stuart. Uh, Matt, I'll hand things over to you to introduce yourself. Sure, my name is Matt Mabor. I'm a FME Flow Technical Support Specialist, so working with customers to help them get the most of uh, FME Flow and helping them resolve any issues they may run into with the product. Right, thanks, Matt. Uh, my name is Stuart Harper. I'm the VP of Product Development. I've uh, been at SAFE uh, for two, since 2008 now. So, uh, yeah, I've worked in customer success and on the development side as well. So, yeah, excited for uh, talking about stream processing today. Awesome. And we also have Evie joining us on the back end here today to help with any questions that you might have. And with time remaining at the end, we'll also have a live Q&A session. Just quickly, if you are new to Livestorm, if you have any audio issues throughout, you can click that help button on the bottom left. It has four troubleshooting steps. Share your emoji reactions with us throughout the webinar with that button on the bottom middle. We will have a poll coming up. So keep an eye on that polls tab on the bottom right and I'll guide us there once the time comes. Um, as I just mentioned, the questions panel. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please do get those in to the questions tab. And lastly, the chat, keep letting us know where you're tuning in from and leave any comments there. All right. And lastly here, if you would like to download the slides to follow along live, you can do that with the download button on the top right of the PDF here. So with that, I'll get our presenters to turn off our webcams just to save on some bandwidth for the rest of the webinar here. And I'll pass it back to the team for our agenda. Great, thanks Elizabeth. Yes, yeah, so uh, the agenda today will talk about what data streaming is, what the sources of data streaming are. Um, we'll talk about data streaming in the context of spatial data. Uh, and then we'll start to get into more of the demos. So Matt will actually walk us through some of the patterns that we can use uh, when building out the workflows in FME form. And then he'll show examples of running uh, the workflows um, on FME flow. So lots to get through today. Uh, we'll start by uh, just giving an overview of uh, working with continuous data streams and some of the terminology involved because there's a lot of different terminology out there. Um, you might have heard the phrase data streaming. You might have heard the phrase stream processing. Uh, you might have heard the phrase real-time processing frameworks. So I kind of just want to give a brief overview of these different terms um, because we're going to use them interchangeably uh, throughout the presentation and, and in our material as well, to be honest with you. So the two main terms you're going to hear um, when you Google things is data streaming and stream processing. So data streaming, this is about connecting and then transferring data across systems. So it's about connecting to these message brokers, connecting to the source of the streaming data, and then transferring the data to it across the system. So an example would be connecting to a Kafka message broker and then um, ingesting the data and writing it out to say Snowflake. So this doesn't handle any processing. It's just basically moving the data from one system to another. And then stream processing essentially adds a layer on top of that. And this is the real-time analysis and manipulation of that streaming data. So filtering, aggregating, um, event detection, things like this. And this is done in memory before you store um, the data. So an example here might be, you might be ingesting a Kafka data, a data from a Kafka endpoint, detailing the locations of a vehicle, and you might just want to filter out a certain vehicle type. So that would be stream processing. You're, you're performing an action on the data before saving it. And the key thing is, is you need to make sure that your um, platform that you adopt does both of these. Many just do uh, stream processing, uh, sorry, data streaming, but you need to make sure it does the stream processing as well. So the other the other thing here is, is, is time to value of data. So many organizations, they're looking to reduce the time gap between data arrival and its analysis. And this is a key part of why organizations adopt stream processing. If the time between when the data is generated and when you process it is short, 
then that data is actionable. And that's what the graph's showing here. The blue uh, line is basically making decisions on data that's happening now. And as you can see, if you leave this for a long period of time, the value diminishes. So that's what we're going to talk about today. How do you build out an architecture that can really process the data and derive value on what's happening now? You can see for traditional decisions uh, using kind of batch processing, that, that there is less pressure on, on, on processing the data immediately. For example, you might process data quarterly or annually on sales data, and that's fine. There's no rush to do that because you're not trying to kind of, um, the data's not as actionable and you're not trying to derive value as, as it happens. So yeah, so with data streams, you can take action on what happening that on what's happening now. That's that's the key kind of message here that we're kind of trying to drive home. And the other important point is your data integration platform, it must include all data regardless of velocity. So it's no good if you if you're using a platform and then you say, oh, my velocity, my data volumes have gone over, you know, so many messages a minute. Now I need to move to another system. So many uh, enterprise integration platforms do not support this high velocity data. And, you know, as, as we all know, many of you probably here because your enterprise is just more and more the data you're getting is, is higher and higher velocity. So you need to make sure that the, the, the platform can handle that high velocity data. So what are the sources of data streaming here? So obviously I've got a list here. Let's get people to chat as well. Um, what are your sources that you're thinking about um, that, are, that are high volume, that you're thinking you might need a stream processing engine to handle? Obviously, uh, the, the, the big one we see is Internet of Things. So this could be, with, with here's some examples we've seen, sensors on rolling stock, on, on, on trains, um, autonomous mind with sensors, um, fleet tracking on vehicles, um, so that's kind of one, one area we've got uh, telemetry and SCADA data maybe coming off wind turbines, temperature sensor flood data. Um, there we go, we've got automated rain gauge data. That's a good one. Oh, animal, animal collar tracking, yeah. So these are all kind of sensor-driven data streams, event streams. And then other, the other two kind of areas that we don't run into as often, but we can handle are business applications and digital information. So business applications would be things like when Visa are collecting transaction data. That's a huge amount of data coming in, millions of records um, every minute. Um, and so you need actually to, to build out a stream processing framework to handle that. Same for digital information. Let's say you're, you're tracking clicks on a website on Amazon.com. Again, huge streams of, 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 of click information here. So yeah, stock market is is another one there, Frederick. Yeah, so uh, again, yeah, market data is is a source. Now we we tend to play more in the Internet of Things, and but that's not because we don't support the others. It's just historically that's what our customers have, have, have come with to us. <clears throat> so yeah, thanks for um, live chat in the comments there. Let's see if we've got anything. Mind dispatch records. That's an interesting one. GPS sensors on police cars. Um, okay, yes, yeah, so there's a good a good range there. So let's talk about spatial data in the context of these streams. Um, I actually think a lot of the things people just mentioned, they're going to have a spatial component to them there. So, <clears throat> you know, the world in which we live is spatial, as you as you all know that. Your phone is tracking your every move. Um, not just indoors, but outdoors. Modern vehicles, when you get in your car, um, you know they're tracking your position. The cereal that you eat in the morning uh, to get to the store where you bought it, it's been tracked on the train, it's been tracked on the airplane, your package has been tracked. So spatial data is, is just integral to life, really. And, and as an organization, if you're not leveraging that spatial data, uh, then you're going to be at a competitive disadvantage. So, you know, spatial data, for those of you who are already in the kind of geosector, you know that 
it reveals relationships and insights to help you make better decisions. And this just doesn't, if you're just focusing on tabular data, you're just going to miss these relationships completely. Um, and so, yeah, without this spatial data, you're going to miss opportunities, which means you're going to allocate resources poorly and ultimately fall behind your competitors. Um, and the, the, the last point here is spatial data enables you to see both when and where events occur. So without the spatial component here, you can't do the where part. And that's so important, especially when you're talking about GPS sensors, because the where is, I would argue, that's at least half the value is, is where the event happened, not just when it happened. So spatial data in data streams is no different. Spatial data is prevalent in data streams, just as it is within normal kind of, I'll call it kind of low velocity streams. Uh, so you need to make sure that you can handle spatial data and gain value from the data that's coming in from the data streams, just in the same way you can with, with the lower volume streams as well. Here's a few scenarios um, that you can read about that linked in a presentation that we've seen our customers working with spatial data and streams. I've got lightning strikes is an interesting one. There's way more lightning strikes than I could ever imagine when we were looking at this as thousands, I think thousands per, per minute happening. Um, and, and the other two stories are very interesting as well. So you can, you can click through and, and look at those. So the key thing here with the FME platform is, you know, spatial data is everywhere, but our support for spatial data is, is far reaching, industry leading. And you can see we have IoT down here as a source, but the key thing is here, you might want to load that data into a GIS system. You might want to merge that data. You might want to overlay that data. So it's very important that you can connect to BIM, CAD, 3D, uh, 3D geospatial databases, point cloud, raster, um, because you, you might want to bring the, um, the, the, the stream data together with these um, other data types. So we have comprehensive, comprehensive support here, really across all data types. And the other point here is with the FME Enterprise, Enterprise Integration Platform, uh, we have two two components to this, FME form, which is where you're going to build your data streaming workflows, and then FME flow, where you're going to deploy your data streaming workflows at scale. Now, the great thing here is when you're building your other types of workflows, you also use form and flow. So you don't need another a system architecture. You don't need to learn new tooling. All you're going to do is kind of approach how you use these tools slightly differently. And Matt's going to talk about that in a second, but it's all the same tooling. So you don't need to ramp your staff up, um, you know, on, on new tooling and, uh, and, and, and figure out how to deploy a new architecture. You can just leverage what you already have. And yeah, the key point here is you build your workflows in form for stream processing, but you deploy your workflows and the stream capabilities are provided by FME Flow. And we'll show you that shortly. So let's get into working with data streams now. Um, and Matt's going to get more into showing FME and, and how, how we actually use it. What I want to talk about is, is streaming data. It is different. And you need to understand the difference to get the most out of things when you're building your workflows within FME. It is a different pattern that you're going to adopt, even though it's the same tooling. So the first thing is, data records are typically small in size so each individual record is typically small in size coming from the message broker it's usually json fragment or xml fragment not usually binary but data velocity and hence total data volume can be very very high obviously even if the json snippets are very very small if you have a million of those coming in every minute then over a 24 hour period, you could be storing gigabytes of data. The other thing is data velocity can be highly variable. So uh, you might have huge spikes in data coming into your system. For example, if you're tracking vehicles during rush hour, um, it's gonna be very, very high, but in the middle of the night, the data volumes are gonna be very low. So you need to make sure that you can handle this um, high variability. Another thing that you don't need to ever really worry about when you're working with 
kind of static data in, in databases is data can arrive out of sequence. You know, sometimes a sensor might not um, sync or it might go offline and then the data might come in 30 seconds, a minute later. So you need to be able to handle that uh, out of sequence data. And we have patterns for that as well. Now, <clears throat> the, the other key thing to recognize is that it's a different mental model when you're approaching working with, we're calling it bounded and unbounded data. That's kind of the industry standard as well. So bounded data is finite. It has a discrete beginning and end, uh, and that's what you do associate with batch processing. So that might be, for example, you have um, a whole bunch of sales records in a database, and every quarter you read that data in, you do processing, and then you output the results somewhere. So that data is bounded. When you read the data in, you know where the beginning and end is. You're throwing a query against the database table and you're reading the data in. But with streaming data, it's infinite. You know, those sensors, they, they, they might die down, but you don't know. You need to be listening all the time. And the data has no discrete beginning or end. And that's what we associate with stream processing. So you're going to connect to those endpoints and you're going to be listening and you're going to ingest the data as it comes in. So you need to, to approach processing that data in a different way. So the next point is we've got, we've got these different profile of data. We've got this different characteristics of what streaming data looks like. The other thing is, is obviously data velocity and, and how that maps um, to the different product components. So <clears throat> for low velocity data, um, you, you're typically you're going to use batch processing. You store the data in the database table, uh, and then you're going to ingest the data. You can also do um, complex event processing with low to medium uh, data velocity. So this would be um, using uh, kind of event processing framework to handle reading the data in and then performing um, actions on the data. And then as your as your data volumes get higher and higher your only option really is data streaming because the complex event processing frameworks fall over and they can't handle the velocity. But you can see there is a, a large amount of overlap uh, because data streaming isn't just about velocity. If you remember the, the, the actionable data chart, if you want extremely low latency, then data streaming is often um, the way to go as well, just because it, it, it's always on and it's always listening. So you get very, very low latency when you when you adopt a, free, a streaming framework. So what does this look like in FME? So we're not going to talk about the batch processing today. That's, you know, that's very well kind of documented with FME. Event processing in FME maps to FME flow automations. So this is uh, low to medium data volumes, maybe one a second, maybe up to 100, but probably around you know, 50 messages a minute. Uh, and, and latency, probably a little bit higher than one second even, but definitely one second and up. Uh, and, and this model is also triggered by events, but it can trigger very, very complex workflow orchestration on this side. So you can, you can build up a lot of logic, chaining workspaces together, um, triggering different things that are going to happen and doing parallel processing and things like that. So <laughs> extremely powerful here, but it it does start to fall over, <laughs> excuse me, when, when the data volumes get higher. FME flow streams, this can support extremely high data volumes. I've tested personally, I think, yeah, millions of records per minute. Uh, the latency is near real time because it's it's always on and receiving data from the stream. The trade-off here is obviously you can't build big complex workflows that take half an hour to run. Uh, you need to do a, a simpler workflow uh, focused on ingesting data quickly and doing things like filtering, aggregation. But you really need to think about that logic that you're putting in place because the more you add, obviously, the longer it's going to take to do the work. But the key thing here is workflows are authored in form regardless of how they want run in flow. So for both of these, you're going to work author in the same tool. Uh, and this is kind of just a, a visual pattern of what this looks like. So we've got a web app here. 
potentially triggering an event, might be a web socket, might be a SQS message coming in. It triggers an event, the automation picks it up, and then when that job comes in, engines come online and start processing and running the job. This um, on the right is the stream processing. So here we might have multiple IoT devices collecting data. They send that information to the message broker, for example, Kafka, MQTT, and the stream processing framework on FME Flow connects to the message broker. It's on all the time listening. And as soon as a message comes in, um, the engine pulls that message in and starts processing it immediately. So what are the sources of data streams? You've heard me mention a few. We actually spent a, a big, there's a big push a few years ago to make sure we support all key messaging protocols. So typically, well, almost always you're connecting not directly to the um, sensor or the client, but you go through a message broker. So these IoT sensors send messages to a message broker and then the FME platform can connect to this message broker uh, and ingest the data. So we've got RabbitMQ, AMQP, MQTT, Kafka, and then we've got all of the message brokers in the top clouds as well. <clears throat> so yeah, the main message there is kind of, yeah, we can pretty much connect to every mainstream message broker. If we don't connect to one that you wanna see, then please let us know. Yeah, so we've got the first poll question here. Um, it's if you click on polls in the bottom, is your organization currently leveraging or planning to leverage streaming data? Yeah, I'll give everyone a few seconds to answer here. Great. I think we are seeing, we were definitely seeing more organizations talking to us about streaming data. So it'd be interesting to see what people are saying, saying here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like most folks have answered, yes, we currently do. And then also quite a large chunk of folks that plan to within the next one to six months. And then sure. also, you know, another 25 or so percent another quarter within one to two years or within six months to a year. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I think even a lot of cities and, and you know, we we're talking we talking one the other day who they have um, all the parking meters and all of these are going to be streaming data back as well. So a lot of the infrastructure that's going in now has is, is getting sensors kind of built into it. So um, teams are having this data thrown at them and they need to figure out kind of how to, to handle it and process that data. Okay, thanks for that. It's good. Okay, so now I'm actually going to pass things over to Matt. So take it away, Matt. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, we're certainly seeing on the customer success side a lot more uh, requests for demos and streams. And it certainly seems like that IoT infrastructure just continues to grow more all the time. So I'm going to look into uh, spend the next part of the webinar looking at stream processing and FME specifically. And we'll look at some common workflows and a demo. So the first thing we should talk about uh, that Stuart's already touched on, when you're working with raw unbounded data, you need a way to chunk that data up, to break it up, to process it. Um, so when processing that data from a non-streaming data source, like a database or file, that database is at rest. It's bounded and finite. And you can load that data into memory and then sort and group the data before analyzing it. But when reading data from a stream, you can't do this since it's unbounded. It will never finish loading. So this is where windowing comes in. Uh, windowing means you're basically taking the data and breaking it into time-based groups. And then you can take each one of those groups and analyze them downstream. And so we have a transformer in FME, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the product already, called the Time Windower that we'll look at shortly. Um, so for example, if you're reading in a stream from a sensor and the data points were coming in at roughly, say, one point a second, um, so a lower volume stream, you might choose to window that data on a one minute interval. And this would mean that you would have roughly 60 points per one minute period to process. So let's look at um, 
some of the core stream processing workflows quickly. We'll look at uh, filtering, enriching that incoming unbounded data, aggregating it, which is very common. You only want to uh, aggregate uh, each window that you're processing and detecting events in that data so that you can take action in near real time. So first we'll look at filtering. Uh, the more data that is being sent and kept, the higher the cost. So you have to ask, do you really need to save it all? And there's two real key types of filtering here. Um, there's filtering on attribute values, so reading the attribute values on the incoming data, applying a filter condition, and then discarding the data that doesn't meet that condition. And there's also filtering on location. So comparing the location of those incoming messages, quite often they're points, um, to a, something like a geofence polygon and discarding the message if it doesn't fall within that, within that geofence. So this would be an example in FME form um, using a transformer that probably several of you are already familiar with, the test filter. So here we're taking, um, in this example, a stream from Kafka and we're filtering on an attribute to determine what data is kept and written out downstream. So next we have enriching. So this is joining our unbounded data to other data sets. And there's a few different ways to do this. We could join again, depending on an attribute value. Um, so we're reading in the incoming data and joining it to a database. This expands on filtering. So we test where the incoming record matches with the database and discard it if it doesn't match. And we can also enrich based on location. So this would be something like reading in the point geometry. A lot of this sensor data is points and overlaying it on a geographic region. So we're adding the region data in this case to the point data, um, or again, maybe filtering it out if it's not in a certain region. So we have a lot of different transformers in FME to enrich your data. Um, the one in this example here is the database joiner. So here we're using a one of the other um, broker connectors that Stuart mentioned, the AWS IoT connector, that's taking in some um, a, a stream of data and outputting JSON messages. And we're joining it here uh, to an SQLite database to enrich the data. And so unbounded streams can contain huge amounts of data uh, but if your end goal is to summarize that data, it'd be very costly to store it all before processing. So summarized blocks of data defined by time window or geographic boundaries can be aggregated and processed from the stream before committing to disk. So an example here would be something like the average speeds of vehicles crossing a bridge during rush hour in a one minute video or a, in a one minute window, sorry. Um, we don't need to keep all the vehicle speed data, just an aggregate. Um, for that one minute window. And popular transformer we have for doing this aggregation is our statistics calculator. This would let you um, calculate averages, um, counts, min and max, your typical aggregate functions on that incoming data stream. So next, let's finally look at event detection. Uh, not every stream processing workflow involves storing the data. So we can also detect patterns in memory and then trigger an event when certain, can, certain criteria are met. Uh, this means decision makers can receive alerts when a noteworthy event happens without the cost and effort of committing all that stream data um, to disk. So events could be triggered by location or after exceeding a threshold. So for example, um, let's say you have a fleet of vehicles you're monitoring with GPS sensors. Um, if a fleet vehicle leaves a certain geofence, like say a service area for an extended period of time, you might want to trigger an alert. And to do that comparison, we could use a spatial filter. So in this example here in the top left, we're reading in a static geofence. Geofences are not always static, as we'll talk about shortly. But in this case, it's a static geofence. And we're passing that into our spatial filter 
Um, and then as our candidate features, we're, we're passing in points from a Kafka stream. And then we're going to tag any that are outside of our boundary. In this case, it's the city of Vancouver city limits. And uh, we'll use our, our time window where that we're going to look at more to window on 30 minutes. And we're going to send a notification only if a vehicle um, is out of Vancouver for more than 10 minutes. So there would be more downstream processing to make that happen. I just wanted to focus on that spatial filter for event detection here. So geospatial data and analysis and stream processing. Let's talk a little bit more about that. We've already spoken about filtering on geofences in the prior filtering workflow we looked at. It's important to note that the geofences themselves, as I just mentioned, might be moving as well. So the last example of static, they might be moving as well. So you may need to reload that geofence periodically, perhaps when each window changes. And the time window where we're going to look at has, um, has an output port for doing that. There's also proximity analysis. So for example, um, if there's a gas leak detected um, from an incoming data stream, you know, where is it? Who is affected in the area? Snapping data to a network is very helpful when we're doing geospatial processing on unbounded data. So for example, snapping vehicle points to, um, to road network lines Doing this on an unbounded stream before the data is committed to the database is beneficial because that data can be filtered and cleaned before storing it, saving you some time and effort and cost. And lastly, calculating distance. So this could be the distance between two moving points, for example, like aircraft. Okay, so we're going to walk through a demo here. I have a few um, intro slides. We'll look at some of the transformers we're going to use, and then we'll do a live demo. And our demo is going to be on the first workflow uh, example I covered, which is filtering data by attribute. And then we're going to thin the data within a time window. So we'll look at our time window or transformer. Our scenario for this demo is a data stream of City of Vancouver fleet vehicles. Um, there's nearly 2,000 vehicles of different types. So we have trucks and cars and other types of equipment. In our scenario, we only want to keep the trucks. So that's where the filtering is going to come in. And we only need the last truck position in each 30 second window. We don't need every truck position. So we're going to thin the data out before writing it to our destination as well. So the high level steps, steps here, we're going to read from a Kafka stream, filter on the trucks and window every 30 seconds before writing out to Snowflake in this example. And so the start here is our time windower. Um, this groups incoming unbounded data into time-based windows that we've talked about. Um, it has a tolerance to account for messages that arrive out of sequence. So you might have some messages that come before or after. Um, those can be output through another port and handled downstream. Um, and in our scenario, we're going to create 30-second windows. And then we're going to use a sorter. Um, this makes sure that the windows data is sorted so that we can get the last location for each truck. And we're going to be grouping on our window ID that we'll see that gets output by the time windower. And finally, to get the last truck in each window, we'll use a sampler. So in this case, we'll group on both the window ID and the vehicle ID. And we're just going to keep the last vehicle um, from, from each window. OK, so I'll share my screen now. Great. So as Stuart mentioned, um, we start in FME Workbench, whether we're building a stream, um, an automation, wherever it may be. We have a Kafka connector here set to stream mode that's going to receive data from our stream. I could switch this over to batch. Um, these broker transformers um, do have that mode for testing as well. But since we're going to publish this up to FME flow, I'm going to leave that as stream mode. So I've got a collapsed bookmark here. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we're basically going to do some JSON parsing of those messages coming from our stream. And we're also doing our filtering on trucks there. But I really want to focus on this part here where we're using the time window. Or so we just covered, um, we've got our 30 second window. Our data does have timestamps. So I've identified that here. It doesn't have to have timestamps. You could window based on when the data is coming in. Um, 
And here's the tolerance settings I mentioned. So um, I set a five second tolerance on on the incoming data. So we're gonna we could capture um, any out of sequence data. And the real important part is that window ID. And we're gonna use that window ID that comes out of the time window or downstream in our sorter here. Um, so we're sorting by vehicle ID. We're grouping by that window ID. And then in our sampler, uh, we're grouping by both the window ID and the vehicle ID when that group changes to take the last feature. So that window ID really creates those chunks on your unbounded data to let you process it downstream. And finally, we're gonna, um, again, group on the window. When that group changes, we're gonna write out that chunk of records to Snowflake. So we could run this in FME Workbench, um, but we wanna really host our stream on FME Flow, and there's many benefits to that. Uh, so we'll publish it up to Flow here. I've already got my connection. This does use an Apache Kafka connector, which is a package from the FME Hub. So I need to publish that up to Flow as well. And now let's flip over to FME Flow. So here we are in Flow. We'll see on the interface here on the left, we have streams. Uh, no streams currently, so let's create one using the workspace we just published. We'll give it a name. And we'll pick our repository and workspace that we published. And when I click OK, we'll see stream is started. But it's not actually doing anything yet because we haven't assigned any engines. So every workspace that runs on FME Flow needs an engine. And in the case of streams, this is one of the benefits over running this in workbenches, we could just actually assign multiple engines to handle a very high volume stream. And we can choose the type of engines. So because streams may have uh, peaks and valleys in the data coming in, this is a great use case for a CPU usage engine. So that's what I'm going to select here. So it'd only be built on when that the engine's actually running and processing data. Now that I've selected that CPU use engine, uh, if I wait a couple seconds, we'll see that the job's been submitted because there has been an engine assigned to the stream. And our stream is running and it's receiving data from Kafka with our city of Vancouver fleet vehicle data. Now, because we're windowing um, every 30 seconds, we don't have anything yet. We need to wait for that elapsed time to pass. Um, so here I'm just, I've just got FME data inspector open, um, and I'm going to connect to our snowflake table. Um, I'll have to give this a little bit of time here for, for our window, our first window to pass. And I'll click refresh. I'm going to have to reconnect to snowflake because that temp, that table's empty. And here we go. Here's our first window. Our first 30 seconds has passed. We have, uh, 21 points that have come in, only the trucks. Um, we filtered out the rest and we've only kept the last truck location within that 30 second window for each vehicle. Um, just making the points a little easier to see here because they're a bit small, that's a bit better. Okay, so now let's wait for one more window to pass and we'll see the next group of trucks come in. As we're playing with the display, that was about 30 seconds. So if we hit refresh, we've got another another group of trucks, some more points on the map. So here we've gone through an example of filtering the data, keeping only the trucks and also thinning it out um, using a sampler to just keep that truck, the last truck position in each 30 second window. So that uh, concludes this demo. I'll stop sharing here. And we'll go back to our slides. So in summary, um, sensors and data collection are exploding, as we talked about. Uh, more and more people are, if they're not already using uh, streams, they're interested in using them. FME can connect to many different streaming sources, as Stuart showed earlier on that slide. We have at least a dozen, I believe, but pro probably more now. And we can help detect spatial and non-spatial events in your unbounded data and notify stakeholders, as well as filter, aggregate, enrich data in real time. So this is gonna help you deliver insights faster and make for more satisfied customers. Um, so I'd like to pass it back to Elizabeth now to conclude things. Awesome, thanks, Matt. 
Yeah, so just briefly here, if you are newer to what we do here at SAFE, we've been solving data challenges for over 30 years now. We just celebrated our 30th anniversary this past year. We operate in over 128 countries around the world and yeah, almost 30,000 community members as well. Some resources briefly here before we wrap up and head on to our Q&A portion, which actually now is a good time to pause and just remind everyone, if you do have any questions from the content today, from what Matt and Stuart presented, please do get those questions into our questions tab. All right, so resources. Get our ebook on spatial data for the enterprise. You'll see the short link there, fme.lygzc. Our FME Academy and Knowledge Base are both great places to learn um, how to knowledge articles as well as guided learning at your fingertips. So a couple short links there that you can check out. Those are great resources to get a deeper dive into your learning. And then webinars, um, safe.com backslash webinars. We have a lot of great content coming up and then as well as hundreds of webinars on demand to browse through depending on what you're looking for. Next steps following today's webinar. If you have anything that you'd like to chat with us about further to do with data, contact us at info at safe.com. And the FME Accelerator course, it's just 90 minutes free of charge and it's a great place to get started learning the ins and outs of FME at a high level. And our all new solutions page. This page is real time data stream processing, all about empowering better decision making for your organization. Highly recommend you check this out. It was actually just published, I think a day or two ago. So it is brand new and it's a one stop shop to learn more about data stream processing. I will also drop the link for this in the chat so that folks can access it directly. And then also, I know Matt, you were mentioning we have this knowledge base source as well on working with real time data and FME. So that's another great resource as well. And I will drop that in the chat too. Yeah, I think that one will be very helpful for a lot of people. Um, we'll address questions coming in in the chat and the questions panel here shortly, but I see quite a few uh, questions around, you know, triggering workflows based on events and other websites. And that's more of an automation event, um, event handling use case. And so that page that uh, you just mentioned, Elizabeth, kind of covers the differences in those two and provides lots of different uh, tutorials and explanations on those different methods. Fantastic. All right. And so also claim your community badge as a thank you for joining us here today. I will drop that code in the chat. So if you aren't yet a part of the FME community, we definitely encourage you to check it out. It's a great place to network with other users and FME experts as well. Yeah, so today's code 23CVKM. And once you're on the community page, you have to scroll down just a little bit and it's on the right side where you enter that. And with that, we do have some time remaining here, about 15 minutes for Q&A. So I'll get our presenters to turn back on their webcams and we can take a look at the questions panel here together. Great. Thanks everyone for dropping questions in. Okay. Just taking a look. <laughs> so are you going to enhance feature caching in combination with streaming services? So at the moment I have to switch to batch mode to be able to get into a state where I can inspect something. So this is an FME form um, when you're um, building your workflows. It's kind of fiddly because you're in stream mode, you're running it, and then you can't do the um, live the feature caching to inspect features. So you have to run in batch mode, look at the features, and then switch back. Um, we have talked about this internally. Um, it isn't currently on the roadmap, but um, yeah, it's good to know that uh, you run in, you ran into the issue as well there because it's something I've noticed. So um, this is something we could definitely tackle uh, in the future. Uh, 
Um, there's a question, is it possible to harvest the survey one, two, three data from publicly available ArcGIS online web map? We're gonna have a webinar in uh, a couple weeks around automations. Um, this sounds like a better use case for uh, an automation if I'm understanding the, the, the question correctly. Um, we certainly have triggers in automations, like for example, our, our webhook trigger um, every time a survey one, two, three response is submitted, you can trigger an automation in your real time. Um, but that wouldn't be uh, the best use case for, for streams. It would be possible, but not, not the best use case. And I just dropped a link in the chat to that webinar in case anyone's interested to register and check that out. I think it's a similar story for SharePoint as well, uh, <clears throat> Matt. I think you would, uh, yeah. you could, I don't think there is a SharePoint document watcher, is there? But uh, I think you can use webhooks, potentially, SharePoint webhooks to, to sync. Yeah, I haven't played with the SharePoint webhooks myself. They, they do have them. They seem to be a little more uh, complex to set up than, than a Survey123 webhook, for example, where you can set mm -hmm. it up through the Survey123 web interface. I think the SharePoint one is a little more programmatic, mm -hmm. um, but they are out there. And that's another case where we will cover that in our webinar in a couple of weeks, um, our webhook trigger and automations. Um, and something a lot of people do with SharePoint, just because the webhooks seem to be a little bit more complex for customers to use, is they'll often use a polling, um, a polling workflow there. So we have another trigger and just, they'll just poll uh, for SharePoint changes every you know five minutes or hour or whatever their requirements are usually people don't need to be notified um, at very high frequency for for th things like that you know an hour is good enough but it all depends on the use case okay there's a question here has there been exploration for how often you can support integrate with Esri's new product velocity are you familiar with this one Matt I've heard of it. Yeah, that's that's a new. Um, I'm not quite sure if that's going to replace some of the streaming functionality in GeoVent server or if it's its own going to remain as its own standalone product. But yeah, it's it's, it's newer, um, and I haven't done a deep dive on it yet myself. Um, so I couldn't. You know, has has there been excellent exploration into it yet? I'd say no in, in terms of how those two can work together. But it's certainly something that I would like to explore further. Yeah, no, same for me. I haven't done a deep dive on it. We could look at that there. Maybe get a thumbs up if anyone else is uh, is using Velocity. Oh, again, upvote. Yeah, okay, got one upvote. Okay, what was oh, uh, <clears throat> Are there any plans to implement a stream reading service on Flow so that it doesn't block an engine? Um, so, I mean, the whole, the, the kind of the whole approach when we were building out a stream processing framework on flow was that to get the low latency and the high volume, you need that engine to be up. You need it to be listening at all times. So that's kind of the system architecture that we've created. And, and because of that, when a message comes into Kafka or MQTT within kind of less than 40 milliseconds, it can be in the FME infrastructure being processed. So that's the pattern we've employed. So you do need to assign an engine to a stream. Now saying that Matt mentioned earlier, the um, is it CPU engine time uh, licensing. So you can, instead of paying for an engine, you can, you can buy CPU engine time. And the thing is with the CPU engine time is you only run down that engine time effectively when a f when features come in. So if you have an engine sat listening to Kafka and it does nothing for 12 hours a day, it doesn't run any credits down. And then when features come in for processing or there's a spike, then it runs um, credits down. So that's kind of the, the model that we're employing so that we don't take a full engine up at all time. There's a good question here. Um, 
from Ian Fletcher. Uh, uh, do you have any good streaming resources that you can rec recommend for people who might want to play with some of these new techniques? Um, that's certainly something we're always looking forward to are some, some publicly accessible streaming um, streaming resources. Uh, there's very few because streams are expensive to host. Um, there's very few available, to be honest. And internally, for a lot of our testing, we've kind of created our own with a lot of data. You know, you could look at creating um, you have millions of records sitting in, in, for example, Google BigQuery that are feeding a, a Kafka stream uh, we've created or Kafka broker we've created. Um, so you could look at doing something like that, but don't really have um, any good publicly available ones that I could I could share. If you have any, then please share them with us. Yeah, you know what, there, Stuart. Ian, um, Network Rail used to have some that I played around with a long time ago, but they were very complicated. But they were behind a login, but you could access rail data feeds to do with scheduling and stuff. So maybe have a look at that. Yeah, they are expensive because streams cost money on the egress as well. So if you put a public one out there and someone, you know, starts using it, it's going to cost you money. That's that's the tricky part. You could use, um, what do we use? We use um, Confluent, don't we, Matt? So that's a hosted Kafka. Yeah. And it's, it's pay per use. I think, our, you know, we have <clears throat> demo servers set up internally and I think it costs us $2 a month and you can just launch a Kafka and start sending data into it for testing. And yeah, that's Confluence, a good platform for kind of getting very, very qu quick start with Kafka. Yeah, that's a great suggestion for sure. Hmm. Okay, that question from Stefan's interesting if you want to post that one up there. <laughs> okay. Okay, so each incoming MQ message, MQTC event needs to join to that 1 million devices. 500 events per second. So you've got 500 events coming in and each event needs to join to a million devices. I wonder if the devices are static or if they're updating as well, because when you start the stream, you could load those 1 million devices into memory potentially using a reader and then the join should be quite fast shouldn't it Matt but if you're having to go yeah. out ev on every message if you're having to go out and rejoin that's going to be tricky it'd be a bottleneck for sure yeah getting that into memory um, ahead of time would be would be helpful I mean I'm trying to think of another option of maybe um, only loading the devices you need or something like that, but it depends. We need more info. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tricky when you're going out, but if you can get the, if you can get things loaded into memory, when you start the workflow, then that's, that's the way to do it. But if they are updating, then, um, you could, you could offload the workflow to an automation as well or something like you can, yeah, depending on, how you do it. I think it's best if they reach out and we can try and figure something out. Yeah, I, I wonder how much control they have over the the stream source or if it's just something they have to ingest because perhaps yeah. breaking that into a few different topics um, where you know you maybe don't need all million devices and, and having a few streams running to help process such a large volume might be an approach. But yeah, like you say, the best option is probably to reach out, get more details. Can we use multiple webhooks in a single workspace? Ah, okay. This we can answer more broadly, can't we? Can you use multiple streaming, I don't know what you want to call it, transformers in a, in a workspace? No. So one workspace, one Kafka connector, one WebSocket yeah. connector. Um, otherwise, it gets very complicated. Well, it just, it just doesn't work. So 
yeah, it's 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 that one to one mapping. So if you wanted to do more than one, you'd have to create two workspaces, and then what you could do is aggregate the data, or you could then pass the data downstream to another workflow once you've ingested the data from the the multiple web hooks. Um, so that's the pattern there. Yeah, in Kafka, you you can with our Kafka connector monitor multiple topics. So you, if you do have a few different topics, a few different types of messages, you could uh, process those in the same workspace potentially. Mm -hmm, that's true, right? With yeah. one connector. I think a webhook's hard coded on the URL, though, is it? Yeah, webhooks is kind of a different uh, a different beast. Um, bit lower level, isn't there? There's less flexibility. Yeah, and I mean, you would. I'm just trying to, to kind of interpret the question. Because um, you can create a workspace webhook in FME Flow and trigger that work that workspace via webhook. There's also webhooks from other applications, you know, Survey123, like we just mentioned, that could be coming into FME that you want to trigger a workspace on. Um, but I think in either case, yeah, it's, it's you know, a workspace is one webhook if you're triggering it or you're receiving a webhook from one source like Survey123 um, to trigger a workflow. I suppose in an automation, you could have multiple webhook triggers though. If you trying to, I haven't seen that use case myself yet, but you could have one workspace that perhaps um, processes data more generically and is triggered by, you know, maybe three or four different web applications by webhook, mm. but it falls outside of the streaming, um, outside of the stream processing that we're talking about today. I have seen one pattern actually that a customer came up with that we haven't even thought of where they have basically an HTTP caller with a decelerator in it and they create a work it's essentially a long pole and they register mm -hmm. it with the stream and it runs and then it fails and it retries it runs and, and, it, and stream processing basically it's it runs the job and if it fails it immediately restarts it so what they're essentially doing is polling continually an endpoint by using mm -hmm. a non-streaming um, transformer in the workspace so that was that was an interesting workflow because it's essentially like running the workspace in a fault tolerant way. That's right. And, that, and that's a great point. I didn't bring up in the demo. Um, another benefit of hosting your stream on flow is that it is fault tolerant. If it fails, let's say there's a connection problem, FME flow is going to restart it for you. I forgot to mention mm -hmm. that. So thank you for bringing that up. That is, that is important. Whereas with an automation, for example, you know, if the workspace, say your webhook triggers a workspace and that workspace fails, it's just, it's failed in the next event. So hopefully it succeeds, but um, it's a little more fault tolerant with, with streams. All right. Okay. It looks like we've gotten to all the questions now. Unless Stuart or Matt, you see anything else you want to touch on further? I think that was good. I think we've covered everything there. Mm -hmm. All right, so folks, we will stay online a couple minutes longer just in case you do have questions that come to mind or pop up that we'll um, be able to get to on the back end there. But in the meantime, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today and for your time, and as well to Stuart and Matt for your time in preparing this content and sharing it with us today. If you do have a moment to fill out our webinar survey, we really appreciate any feedback. It helps us improve our program. So I did just drop that link in the chat a moment ago. Um, and yeah, a recap of next steps. We also do have our data streaming blog, safe.com backslash blog. So I'll give a shout out to that as well. And with that, bye for now, everyone, and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Right, thank you. Thanks thank for you listening. For joining.